Uh, Commissioner, I just want to quickly follow up more with a statement than a question, but you're free to comment on it. Uh, you had a back and forth with Councilmember Rosenthal and the Special Victims Division. And a DOI made the following statement in one of its annual reports. It said, a year-long investigation found that the Police Department's Special Victims Division, which investigates cases involving sexual assaults, was understaffed and under-resourced. Following this investigation, the Police Department added over 60 new investigators to the SVD squads that investigate adult sex crimes. Upgrades to current SVD facilities are underway and new facilities are being planned. And the prioritization of stranger rape over acquaintance rape ha has ended. Um, it, it's the, the final statement gives the impression of mission accomplished. And I'm not aware of a single advocate or a member of the city council who has been working on this issue who, who thinks that it's that the NYPD has actually prioritized, uh, ended the prioritization of strange rape over acquaintance rape. It's not a question, but, but it's a concern that's been relayed to me, and I thought it was incumbent of me to relay it to you. So, uh, Council Member Traeger. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Torres. Uh, welcome, Commissioner. Um, I just, uh, in your, in your testimony, I, I'm reading here that um, you've had the opportunity to meet several times with the SCI commissioner um, and that she has an annual uh, reporting function uh, to your office, even though they are largely independent of DOI. And she has kept you up to date on referrals she makes to the school's chancellor and on public statements that she makes. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, so I want to preface before I kind of go into, into this questioning that I understand that she technically really just started last year um, and started, stopped, and started again. So I, 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 I appreciate that and understand that. Um, can you share with us what public statements has she made or has, they, has that office made as far as that they, they've kept you up to date on and also what referrals that they've made to the chancellor? Uh, so I can't, sp I, I, I can't talk about any specific referrals, but I can tell you that in just the three months that I've been DOI commissioner, I have reviewed, I would estimate well over a hundred referrals to the chancellor based on findings that SCI made about particular situations of employee misconduct or, or financial fraud. I know from my conversations with Ms. Coleman that um, given, I think, as you referenced, sort of the difficulties and turmoil of the past year, um, th there's quite a bit of backlog at SCI in processing I don't want to diminish them by calling them routine, but within the context of SCI's work, these routine referrals from the Department of Education, and from, from my vantage point, I think they are working very diligently to sort of catch up and clear through that backlog and address some of the staffing issues and so on from the past year. I know Ms. Coleman is very committed to getting through that backlog and pivoting to create a space to do more systemic, long-term, wide-ranging investigations. Um, I've made myself available to her as a resource uh, for that planning, um, and I think that cooperation will continue. So um, it has been a, a difficult year for SCI, and I think um, Ms. Coleman seems to have her arms around what needs to be done in the sh both the short term and the long term. Uh, so I look forward to seeing what they'll do in the months ahead. And can you shed light on uh, on what? public statements the office has made? In oh, uh, so, uh, you know, I'm racking my brain. I think there's been at least one press release. So and any, any sort of press releases or, or other public comments, um, we get notified that they're going to make one. Uh, so it was a very busy time, but I'm recalling, I, I think I'm recalling one in December, there was a press release about an arrest. Um, but there have not been any reports, I think, if that's what you're asking about, in the three months that I've been at DOI. So I, I think I've expressed this before, and, and I remain very concerned that I, um, understanding that the commissioner is still relatively new in the position because of, of what happened the past year, but I remain very concerned that I am having difficulty finding any, any evidence of systemic reviews over the city's largest department. Um, 
It is my understanding that back in 2014, SCI handed to the former chancellor a report of some kind dealing with OPT. It's not clear what the report entailed. Uh, it's not clear what the outcome of, of, of that referral uh, was. But what's clear is that last year, when my committee, Education Committee, uh, held a hearing on OPT, we learned of deep troubles in that office. And then I learned after the hearing that there was a federal investigation of OPT. So I, I have to sometimes remind the administration that the council is a co-equal branch of government. You know, we are, we're, we are elected officials as well. Um, we have an important oversight function in city government. And it's very hard to conduct effective oversight if we have no idea and are, I think, intentionally by design kept in the dark uh, about systemic failures, particularly over a department that is responsible for over 1.1 million children and is the largest department over a $33 billion department in the city, the largest department in our city. Um, can you shed any light about any systemic reviews that you've been made aware of that are underway? Because what I'm hearing is that they might be conducting systemic reviews, but they don't have a sense of obligation to report that to the council or report that to the public um, other than a referral to the school's chancellor. And I don't think that's effective government. Uh, we need to know what the problems are in order for, that, for us to, as policymakers, make sure that they, they don't happen again. And if you can just comment on that, I, I'd appreciate it. Sure, I, I, I really don't disagree with anything that you've said. Um, I can't comment on specific investigations that are ongoing at SCI, but I know that there are a number of what I would characterize as long-term or systemic investigations um, that are ongoing. Uh, and what the results of those will be, I don't know. But I, I do think that SCI should be applying the same standards that we do at DOI. It, it's, it's, a, it's a gray area for sure, um, a circumstances-based assessment of when something merits a full-scale public report, when a referral letter to an agency is appropriate. Um, the referrals to the chancellor that I referenced in response to, I think, Chair Torres's question, um, or, or maybe your earlier question, are of the type that would fall typically for any agency, whether it's the Department of Education or any other, to sort of an employee misconduct referral that typically goes back to the head of the agency. But I think it's certainly the case that there will be outputs of systemic or longer term investigations that will merit a public report. And I would apply the same standards to you know, which side the matter falls on as we would apply for any other agency. It is um, of, I'm just flagging, I know this is a budget hearing and, and I appreciate your candor about that your office is in need of additional personnel and, and I think we take that very serious, we have to. Uh, you are the official watchdog and, and I think that we have an obligation to make sure that your office is fully equipped with all the resources you need to effectively do, do the job and of course that concern extends over into SCI as well. I will note that the DOE does have internally OSI which from my understanding deals with many employee misconduct cases and there's sometimes a gray area between which cases OSI takes on versus what cases SCI takes on but I, I think the chair and I have, have discussed this on more than one occasion that we are deeply concerned that we are not seeing any public evidence of systemic reviews over, over DOE. I only learn about them through the press, by federal investigators, not by really city investigators. And also share with you, Commissioner Garnett, that it was not lost on me that I recently chaired a seven-hour hearing on special education 
Um, in addition to the fact that on the eve of my hearing, the DOE announced that they were looking to move past CSIS, which is another technology boondongle the administration has put us through because they spent a lot of money, over $100 million, on this program, only to kind of now say that it was not working. Um, one of their chief technology folks in DOE resigned um, because of some investigation that, again, I was not aware of until I read about it in the press. Were you aware of that investigation b before it became public? Uh, no, I was not. But uh, that, does, that does not mean that no one at SCI was, but if you, I personally was not aware of it, no. Right. This is an area that I think I've flagged a number of times where we spend a lot of money on technology in the DOE, and many school visits that I conduct, internet is not working, not enough bandwidth, and but we're spending this money every month, we're paying someone's bill, um, and I just find it interesting that on the eve of the hearing, they had announced that this person has been either forced to resign or fired due to some investigation that, again, my committee had no knowledge about until we read about it in the press. And th these are the things that we find frustrating because here we're advocating for more money to better meet the technological needs of our schools and of our students, and yet the person in charge of technology was under investigation for some wrongdoing, and we had no clue. Um, and so I really would appreciate, uh, quite frankly, more transparency, uh, and just to be blunt, evidence that the office is functioning beyond uh, employee misconduct cases, which I think technically might fall under the realm of the uh, OSI, but although if, if, it's, if it's greater in nature, I, I understand it might go to SCI, but uh, Commissioner Garnett, I, I, I have not been pleased uh, with the lack of transparency, particularly when I'm hearing that there are referrals being made to the Chancellor, and we have no knowledge whether the Chancellor is, taking them, is, is making changes because of it, what the nature of them are, the outcome, and whether any policy changes are being recommended. And so I plan to follow up with you, hopefully in the near future, as well as with the SEI Commissioner as well. I, I would welcome that. Th thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilor Entrager. Uh, Councilor Riquelos. Uh, Commissioner Garnett, when your predecessor, uh, Mark Peters, was terminated by the mayor, he sent a letter to the city council, uh, and I quote, the context of the mayor's interactions over the past several years with DOI combined with certain ongoing investigations about which the mayor and his senior staff are very much aware must cast the doubt upon the mayor's true motives, end of quote. Uh, what is the status of the ongoing investigations that were referenced by your predecessor? Well, I'm not going to talk about any ongoing investigations, but what I can tell you is that no investigation at DOI has been closed because of Mark Peters' firing. Uh, within the same statement, uh, your predecessor references uh, interactions with the mayor's office and the mayor's senior staff. Have you had any contact, interactions, communications, or otherwise with the mayor or his staff related to any ongoing investigations since you're coming on? Um, I have not spoken to the mayor at all since the day of my nomination, other than, um, oh, sorry, since the day of my confirmation, um, other than I was at City Hall for a meeting and he happened to be passing by and he stuck his head in to say hello and we exchanged pleasantries, that was the end of it. Um, I've had no conversations with anyone at City Hall about any particular case other than um, what has sort of always been the case with City Hall where we don't have direct access to City Hall emails or documents, so when we have requests, they go through the um, office of the council to the mayor, and there have been times when we've had conversations specifically about kind of the mechanics and scope of document or email requests, but they haven't been about um, what we are doing on the investigative side, and there has been no interference with any investigation. I, and just to, I, I'm learning, I appreciate your transparency, Typically, when an investigative authority is interested in accessing communications, I, I think we all see on TV, whether fiction or nonfiction, folks showing up in, in j three-letter jackets, 
walking away with computers or uh, uh, other box materials and, and often a daytime surprise. Uh, what, is, what are you finding when you're requesting emails or other data from the administration in terms of whether you're getting the full and complete, including emails that may have been deleted or how are you dealing with the uh, preservation of evidence? Um, so I believe that we're getting what we request. Um, we haven't, I'm not aware of any situations in which we have not been able to get the things that we request. I think it's, it's some of it is mechanical that many mayoral agencies are participate in the email system that we call Clearwell, which enables us to have more direct access to emails. Um, the city hall and a few other city agencies do not participate in that process. So there has to be some mechanism to get things. Um, it's certainly the case that if there were a situation where we perceived a need for surprise or for an additional level of secrecy um, or, or covert operation, we would do whatever we thought was necessary to meet those needs. Have you been able to gain access to people's communications that are uh, relate to their job but are being done through personal communications? Uh, potentially in violation of the rules, such as people using uh, their, their BlackBerry and BlackBerry Messenger, or I'm trying to remember the name of the new app folks use for encrypted communications. WhatsApp. There's WhatsApp and there's another one that's specifically just for, but are, is, that, is that something that you see people still using versus uh, communications methods that are easy, more easily tracked? So when we ask for information, I can tell you that we, we sometimes will specific, depending on the needs of the investigation, sometimes we specifically ask for um, emails from a custodian account that is controlled by City Hall or by the other relevant agency, and sometimes we ask for any communications on any platform which would include personal email and any other platform. It, it, it's also the case that where we have knowledge that um, certainly in a criminal investigation where we have knowledge that um, other means of communication were used, we have all the law enforcement tools that would be appropriate to that, a search warrant or subpoena request to the, um, the internet provider. Should the Mueller report be public? <laughs> I, I'm not gonna comment on that. I, I had a feeling, <laughs> I, I think it should be public. Uh, but where I was going with it is when people make a complaint uh, that merits investigation, would it be possible that even if there's a finding that there is no finding of wrongdoing, that the investigatory report be made available at least to the complaining party so that we can at least see the due diligence and see what conduct occurred and whether it was just a, a problem with the system that gave rise to the complaint uh, or, or in some cases, the joke might be in incompetence isn't always criminal. Well, um, you know, we typically apply, we try to be um, as fair and even handed and consistent as we can in applying the FOIL standards and other standards of public disclosure to our work. Um, it is true that in general, when a matter has been investigated and not substantiated, that that information, that underlying information doesn't become public. That's, I think, a, a useful protection in the FOIL law for, for reputational reasons and privacy. Um, we get many, many complaints at DOI, most of which are very important, some of which are unsubstantiated. Um, and so I wouldn't want to create any kind of chilling effect or deterrent effect of people's um, confidence in DOI's work or willingness to report things even if they're not sure what's going on um, by over-releasing unsubstantiated or inconclusive investigations. But we try to evaluate each situation on, on its merits um, and assess all of the relevant factors for FOIL. So I know that's probably an unsatisfying answer, but um, I wanna be transparent about the factors that go into that decision. I appreciate it. I think it's just when somebody goes to the trouble of contacting DOI, the concern is whether or not the investigation happens and even just having some sort of situation where if you see somebody who, I, 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 there are things that have happened where I look at it and I'm kind of confused about it and concerned about it and have reached out to DOI to say, is this 
is this right? I see people who are reporters in this room who have written stories that I have flagged for DOI because I felt that those stories raised questions of culpable conduct. And uh, I guess to this day, I don't know what has happened in most of those cases. And uh, to the extent there could be a way to let folks know, that would be great. Thank you, Chair. I do have a question. I, I suspect you might resist answering it, but um, your predecessor made reference to a number of investigations that pre-exist your tenure, and he publicly indicated that, that one of those investigations, it's known as the Yeshiva investigation, was close to completion. And um, since the investigation was made public and since uh, former Commissioner Peters made serious allegation of political interference on the part of City Hall. Um, how do we find out as an oversight body whether that investigation had merit or resulted in an actual finding? Um, on that one, given the prior public comment, I can say the investigation is ongoing. I guess the challenge, and I, and I understand the, the need for confidentiality, but when, when you have a, a former commissioner, right, make a serious allegation of possible interference, does, doesn't the public have a right to know whether that investigation had any merit whatsoever? Um, well, the investigation's ongoing, so... It is ongoing. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry, I, didn't, I don't know if oh, I heard Oh, I said that in my prior answer, yes. That, uh, as, as to that particular... Although um, we typically don't comment at all on investigations, I think given the, the public um, statements that have already been made about that investigation, I feel comfortable saying that it is ongoing. Our investigation continues into that matter. And I don't know why Commissioner Peters would say the things he said. What I can say is that I have not um, been on the, on the receiving end of any interference in the Yeshiva investigation. Okay. Um, I asked you earlier about the practice of lying to DOI or, or, or failing to tell the truth in a notarized document. Has, has DOI ever made a referral for criminal prosecution when it comes to lying or otherwise misleading the agency on, on a notarized document on a legal instrument? Yes. You have, okay. How many referrals have you made? I don't know, okay. but do I, know those, that, I know that we have. Do those referrals, how often do those referrals result in actual prosecution? Um, I don't know because I don't know how many um, have gone in, in the past. I only know that during my tenure we have made such referrals um, and those matters are ongoing. Okay. Um, I suspect you answered this earlier, but I just want to, you, if, if DUI receives the 13 new positions that you're requesting, what impact will that have on the timetable for background investigations? So I think um, the, our plan for the 13 positions would be to organize them into two new teams um, that would be five investigators and one supervisor each with shared um, clerical assistance from the admin. And um, those two teams would be, at least until the backlog is significantly reduced, dedicated to what we refer to as aged cases, which is the processing of routine background investigations on a first in, first out basis. Um, so those two teams would be fully dedicated to reducing the backlog of old cases. Um, I think the how long that will take depends on uh, how much the other changes we've made, how quickly they can contribute to efficiencies. But conservatively, we've estimated that if we get the additional staff, we could completely eliminate the backlog in less than five years and maybe sooner and then get the unit on track to what I think is a, re a reasonable and realistic goal, which is to complete all background investigations, regardless of priority or routine status, in 120 days or fewer on average. 120 days, and, and that can be accomplished simply by adding 13 new positions to your headcount? Yeah, so the first task for the 13 new positions would be uh, reducing and eliminating the backlog. And then I think once the backlog is gone and we are current with processing new applications, our attention would shift to reducing the total time it takes us on average to complete a background investigation with the goal of getting that to 120 days or less. So the ultimate goal is, 100, is a timetable of four months, 120 days, right? On average, yes. Okay. Um, how long will it take you to remove the backlog? 
I'm sorry? How long, how long will it take you to remove the backlog? I think four to five years. Four to five years, okay. Even, so with the 13 positions? Yes. All right. How many backlogged investigations do you have? 6,300. So within five years, then we can hope for efficient background investigations, 120 days. Let's yes, ho and, and hopefully sooner. I think that we have made progress um, on how fast we can do things. I think there, my understanding is there was sometimes a practice in the past of, um, in effect, taking the easier <coughs> investigations and moving those quickly, um, which created a situation where more difficult investigations, largely because of out-of-state factors and things like that, were kind of left to remain in the backlog. Um, our current practice has totally changed that. Um, routine backlogged investigations are handled first in, first out, so that um, we are making efficiencies to move it faster, but I think reducing the backlog is key to getting the total time down to 120 days or less. What's the average at the moment? The average amount of time it takes you to complete a background investigation? From date received to date closed is over 500 days on average. Um, again, some of that is driven by the extreme age of what's in the backlog, which we are now working to reduce. So every time we close a case that we received in 2016, that sort of, it's a positive development, but it bumps the average number up. And as we clear the backlog from oldest to current, that number will continue to go down. It just seems to me, how, I mean, have you calculated how many more positions you would need to remove the backlog within a year? Because four to five years strikes me as too long. Uh, well, right now, um, our investigators handle, um, I should double check my numbers. I do have that number of the average they clear in a month. Hold on. So um, that number currently is one investigator, average over the whole unit, one investigator clears just over 140 cases a year. They, cl they, they close up just over 140 investigations a year. So I haven't done the math, and, and I'm a lawyer, not an accountant, so I'd have to do a little bit of calculation about what, how many investigators it would take to clear 6,300 in a year at assuming roughly the same rate of productivity, about 140 each a year. Yeah. But we could run those numbers. I, I, I'd be curious so. to, because four to five years strikes me as too long given the importance of background investigations, and it seems to me the value of a background investigation declines over time. Oh, that is right. If, if there's correct. a person who's been in his position for five or six years giving me the finding of a background investigation six years into his employment strikes me as almost useless. And uh, there's also a funny kind of relationship between um, the time it takes and this ongoing employment in that um, what we categorize as routine background investigations are most likely to take longer. Those are also the positions where the person um, be typically begins their employment. They, they don't have to wait to start working until their background has cleared. Some categories, like commissioners and other very sensitive positions, don't can't start. Can you, can you explain to the public how do you prioritize background investigations? Sure. So um, there are uh, there are we have an intake team that does initial processing of backgrounds. Um, that initial processing includes fingerprinting of the applicant, running a criminal history, conducting an initial interview, doing an education check, New York City residency, and any DOI internal history. Um, after that point, investigation, background investigations are, go to, are categorized either as priority, expedited, or routine. Priority uh, includes generally pe the, the people I referenced who typically cannot start work until they are cleared. That's commission, examples are commissioner level appointees, 
uh, very high level city hall employees. And that Mr. O'Brien would have been a priority? Yes. Um, members of certain boards and commissions, judicial appointees, um, those people typically cannot start until they're cleared and so they are moved into the priority bucket. Um, so can we just do one by one, what's the extent of the backlog when it comes to priority? Oh, there's no backlog. There is no backlog. Yeah. What's the average amount of time it takes you to complete a priority investigation? Um, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, but I would estimate it's probably less than 60 days at the most. Less than 60 days. So as far as you're satisfied with that? Yes. With the performance on priority investigations? Yes. Handling our current workflow, I, I think the unit's doing a great and, and how large is that universe? To priority um, Do you have a number? So we have a combined, I believe it's a combined priority expedite team, um, which is, um, I'm not sure exactly, it would be four or five investigators and a supervisor. What's the total number of investigations? Do you know, like? Oh, the total number of, of investigations. Of, of priority investigations. I is don't it? know off the top of my head. Okay, I can enough. give you that number. And with expedited investigations, can you? Describe what that is. Sure. So um, expedited investigations are um, comprise a couple of categories. Uh, probably the largest category are those applicants that, um, for some reason, have been red flagged by our intake team. So the intake team that I referenced earlier, that's doing these um, initial checks. Those initial checks are driven by the things that in our experience are most likely to produce a result that would be cause for adverse employment decision. So significant criminal history, um, proof that a person has misrepresented their residency in New York City, um, misrepresentations about employment credentials, which might be a requirement for the job. So if there are red flags in the intake process, that applicant would be routed to expedite so that they're those issues can be resolved more quickly because they're in all likelihood going to start working while we're conducting their background check. So there are some background investigations that are by default a priority, and then there are some that become more of a priority by virtue of a red flag that arises in the course of intake, is that? that that's correct. Okay. Um, the expedite team also handles people who have previously been background checked by DOI for any reason. Okay. Um, we can complete those faster um, because we only have to update and um, other agents, executive level agency employees that for whatever reason the agency head has not identified as priority but in DOI's view are going into sensitive positions like a general counsel role or some other high level role in an agency. And so we on our own discretion expedite those um, because they're in a, a more sensitive position at the agency. And then everyone else essentially is in the routine pile, which we- And, and just a question on, on, do you know the num how large that universe is, the number of expedited investigations? Off the top of my head, no, but I can get you that number. Do we know the backlog? Um, the ex I, I wouldn't consider the expedite group as having any backlog. Okay. We're, we work to clear those as quickly as possible, um, and those can range anywhere sort of to 60 to 120 days on average. So that's 60 to 120 days, okay. And then there's routine. Right, and then there's routine. Which I imagine is the largest universe. Yes, sir. Can you tell us what routine is? Routine is basically everyone else. Okay. So it's anyone who doesn't fall into one of the categories that I've already mentioned um, would go into um, our routine bucket, which we currently work from oldest forward so that we are always working to clear the backlog. We don't, in, in debating how to address the backlog of background investigations, the focus has largely been on how do we expand the supply of background investigators. Have you ever considered the possibility that maybe the problem is not supply but demand? Are you doing too many investigations? Like, or, or, like obviously we agree the expedited investigations, the priority investigations, that's core DOI investigative work. Are you, are you doing background investigations on low-level employees in city government or, or uh, investigations that are questionable? Uh, I would say no, okay. um, to the extent so that What's the lowest level employee that you would, in, on, well, on whom you would do a background investigation? So the, the only low-level employees that people I would categorize as low-level employees who would fall within the background group are those who are in a sensitive position. 
They're involved in significant procurement, zoning changes, uh, areas that are particularly susceptible to corruption. They work on sensitive IT infrastructure for the city or for a particular agency. And that's um, described as routine? Uh, well, it depends on the, okay. it, it depends on the position. Um, but the category of managerial employees, which is a category in um, Executive Order 16, is, can be quite large because anyone who's in a supervisory role. Um, Do you know how large that category is? No. Often. The hundreds, is it thousands? Is it? Well, uh, it, it's thousands, but we don't, we, we don't track the background investigations but, by which category. But to my point about demand versus supply, is that category too broad? Um, I think that that is more of a political decision for the mayor but, and the uh, council to make. And, and for the city council. And so as, as the chair of the committee that oversees your agency, I'm asking, do you, in your professional opinion, someone who's on the ground, do you believe that category is too broad? Um, yes, I think okay. the category. So, so I think the category could, that category in particular, could probably be um, shrunk somewhat without affecting the integrity of city operations. So we have not studied that problem okay. in depth. So, so. so my, my ask of you is to come back to the city council. We're likely to have a subsequent budget hearing in May. Tell me, explain to me or delineate how DOI could safely shrink the category of, manager, of routine investigations, managerial positions without jeopardizing the integrity of city government. Okay. Happy to um, do that. Cool. Commissioner, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank okay. you. And I just want to point out that we were joined earlier by Council Members Salamanca, Powers, Traeger, Lansman, and Kalos, and Rosenthal. So. Great. And we only have one panel of two witnesses. We have Greg Woltman from GI Quantum and Tawaki. Komatsu? Yeah. yeah. If you could just yeah, sp uh, yeah, sp speak, speak through the mic if you, so that it can be recorded for the record. Yeah. Can you just let him know that you'll follow up and do that over on the council? The okay. questions that were raised. Greg Waltman, G1 Quantum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Torres. Uh, it's always interesting. Um, I have a clean energy company called G1 Quantum. Uh, we specialize in different types of proprietary innovation. And I was overhearing um, with your department investigation that they wanted a request for some 13 new positions. Obviously, there is a question in the fiscal year 2020 budget with reallocating resources to that with respect to overtime and the types of um, fiscal constraints that would hinder or impair any further um, value expansion of department investigation. And I just wanted to, to articulate a point where we have a proprietary innovation, Quantum Tracks, which is a variation of speed breaker technology, which as track enhancements, I would argue obsolete track enhancements are being conducted this new type of track enhancement could go a long way in supplementing New York City's energy grid, creating the first ever self-sustainable city in the world. So, with that being said, you know, there's obviously ample opportunity to then restructure not only department investigation, um, budgetary constraints, but also different types of Section 8, NYCHA, different types of related issues that can go a long way. So I just wanted to put that out there and that these solutions do exist. And as track enhancements are, you know, underway, it's not, I'm not advocating for a big dig, Boston big dig all at once. I'm just saying as we go along, um, executing along those types of lines would be a superior course of action for the city. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your testimony. Hi. Um, I'm Tawaki Komatsu. We had a conversation on Monday last week at around 5 o'clock outside City Hall by the Broadway entrance. That was after I was illegally kicked out of a public hearing in the Blue Room um, that the mayor held in regards to um, a bill signing um, meeting with regards to labor rights. 
Um, you mentioned me. You mentioned to me during that conversation that, with regards to oversight, you would pursue systemic problems instead of, I guess, individual problems. But a year ago, I also uh, testified in a public hearing with you. That was in March, and I basically testified that there were public town hall meetings, public resource fair meetings, and my testimony then was that I was Ill illegally prevented from attending those public forums. Today, there's a case at the Second Circuit of um, the, the Knight First Amendment Institute versus Trump. Um, they already presented oral arguments in that case at 10 o'clock today. There's an audio recording of that. So I guess with, uh, with regards to the commissioner of DOI who was just over here testifying, I was at her office on Wednesday last week submitting a complaint about what transpired on Monday last week in the Blue Room. But you have my written testimony that uh, I submitted, but let me just quickly play this video recording of what transpired last Monday for Judge Lorna Schofield in my federal uh, court lawsuit against the city. I just wanna, before you play that video, is there any profanity or anything objectionable? No. Yeah. Um. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon. Um, you and I have talked a few times about this company called Entity Data. You've said in the press recently that um, too much money is in the wrong hands. So for the benefit of this audience, I'm gonna begin my testimony by playing back a video that of our conversation on March 15th of 2017 at your town hall in Chelsea. I don't um, know if that's uh, something we accept Actually, First Amendment, First Amendment rights say yeah, I can First Amendment that. rights are great. I just wanna say I don't know if we accept that in the testimony, so we should keep moving forward. Okay, let me just say a quick. Sorry, that's the right oh. This is the aftermath. Face me. Can I get your name? Yeah. Right here. Um, Judge Schofield, so this is Tawak Matsu. I just tried testifying in a public hearing with the mayor in the Blue Room. I was illegally assaulted in that public hearing in the Blue Room by a member of the NYPD. This is his supervisor. I was assaulted by a black male. I asked for their identities. They won't give me it to it. They won't give me his name, his rank. I specifically asked for his, I specifically asked for his name. Um, I tried testifying lawfully. I was illegally prevented from doing that. Can I continue? Uh, that happening, a member of the NYPD. Your, your time has expired, but we, we understand that the point you made. Then I, so I appreciate your testimony. So, so just to conclude. Yeah. Um, with regards to my written testimony, I have to appear in court twice this week. Um, tomorrow is in a housing court case. I submitted FOIL requests to HRA. They have been illegally refusing to comply with my FOIL requests. I, um, I think I previously testified to you that I was assaulted where I reside. So if that's critical to my defense and I have a FOIL right to that information, can you intervene to, I guess, have HRA um, immediately comply with my FOIL rights? This is not a Q&A, so, but, but I certainly, if you have a concern, but you can certainly email my office or relay it to my staff and we can but follow you're up. you're the chairman you. of this co committee, correct? Is, so I, I chair the committee, but I don't, and I ask questions and you testify, so. Okay. And we've heard your testimony and I, I thank you for coming. Thank you, Judge Schofield. Okay. With no further panels, this hearing is adjourned.